Good morning, Penticton Church. It's good to be with you today. Uh, I am glad on this Sunday, Trinity Sunday, for the privilege to be able to lead you into God's Word again this morning. So grateful for Pastor Cal Barber and his ministry over these weeks. And uh, we are uh, have been filling in pieces, he and I together, as we look ahead in anticipation of the arrival of Pastor Brock and family, uh, we think for the first part of July. Let me just quickly tell you what's up in the weeks ahead. Uh, I'm preaching today, and then I will also be with you again next Sunday. The following Sunday is the weekend of our district assembly. The meetings will be taking place formally on the Saturday. There's a bit of a celebration happening on Friday evening, uh, celebrating our auxiliaries, our missions, our youth, um, and our Sunday school enterprises at a district level. Uh, that will all be live streamed and there will be uh, opportunities for you to, to participate in that way. It's not the same as being together, but uh, oh boy, there's light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we, we're going to be able to gather again fairly soon. As part of that weekend, on the Sunday morning, uh, our Legacy Church here in Surrey, where my office is, uh, is going to be live streaming their service and in that service, our uh, General Superintendent, Dr. David Graves, will be bringing the message, and so uh, we're going to give you a link for that so that you can join and be part of that on that uh, Sunday the 13th. Uh, on the 20th, we're, we're just still arranging who's going to be your preacher on that day, and then on the 27th, internationally, the Church of the Nazarene is preparing uh, a service that will be streamed for Nazarenes around the world to participate, and so we're going to join in on that day as well, and then we think and hope that uh, our new pastor will be with us the following Sunday, uh, and if it's going to be delayed at all, we'll make some changes. But uh, what an honor for me to be able to, to bring God's Word to you this morning. On Trinity Sunday, you likely had a focus on uh, Pentecost last week, and the week before that on the liturgical calendar is Ascension Sunday. In fact, on the liturgical calendar, there are um, many significant days that uh, to lesser and greater degrees, we in the Church of the Nazarene take time to acknowledge. Almost all of them are related to a biblical event. So Christmas, so the birth of Jesus. Uh, Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus. Easter, of course, the resurrection of Jesus. And then, as I mentioned, the ascension, which is that occasion where we memorialize and recognize an event, a biblical event, when Jesus, in our flesh, ascends or is taken up back into the realm, the existence of the eternal God, from our place of, of creation, um, uh, finiteness, the, limit, the limitedness of space and time, Jesus in our flesh returns to the, to the infinite realm of the Almighty God. And uh, then Pentecost, of course, the event of the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit into the hearts and minds and into the life of the Christian Church. And then today then, after those, not surprisingly, after the story of Jesus and of his ascension, of the pouring, outpouring of the Spirit, we, we have this day that is, in a sense, sort of consolidating everything that we believe and understand about God, the, the, the one who we serve. We use the language in Christian theology of Trinity, the triune God, three in one. We... Uh, uh, understand that there is this inherent contradiction in our words that we believe that God is one and yet here we go and we acknowledge his manifestation in three different persons and so today uh, in the face of that contradiction that's where I want to dig around that's where I want to look and my hope is that by the time we get to the end of our message today uh, you'll be encouraged in the privilege that we have to be in relationship with the eternal God. And so today, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to encourage you to take uh, them and turn to the Gospel of John, uh, and chapter 14 specifically. We're going to walk through uh, a reasonably long passage, just sort of verse by verse, a little later in this time together. But before we do that, I, I, I want to sort of set the stage and build some introductory comments into this. I was, uh, in anticipation of this, I, for whatever reason, my mind went back to an occasion in uh, Canadian Nazarene College, probably my second year there, so um, uh, probably pretty cocky, thinking I knew everything already, uh, but obviously really early in the journey. And I remember sitting in a class uh, that was being taught by Dr. Kent Brower, 
Dr. Brower was uh, sort of the senior biblical studies lecturer in the school and if you know him and some of you likely do you'll know that he was a gracious and kind man that had an incredibly intimidating aura about him. He was highly educated, his PhD was from the University of Manchester studying with F.F. F. Bruce who was a renowned biblical scholar and uh, Dr. Brower had lectured uh, in, in England and in Canada and the United States and, and we were very privileged to have him there. And, uh, but we would sit in his classes and uh, he, he was pretty straight up. He just would sit at the desk and he would have his lecture notes in a binder and he would turn page after page. It, it, it could be dry at times except that uh, it was so rich with his content that it often invited questions and conversations. And I don't remember what the specific topic was. Uh, I, I really don't know the content of, I don't remember the content of the engagement, but I do remember a specific question. It's remarkable, it's kind of funny that I remember this with such detail, that someone over there, over my, over my left shoulder, asked a question to whatever it was we were talking about, um, what would J.I. Packer have to say about that? J.I. Packer was uh, uh, British born, but Canadian biblical scholar renowned in his own right, and uh, um, I remember Dr. Brower's response. What would J.I. Packer say about whatever it was we were talking about? Dr. Brower, um, you know, would sit there, he would have his reading glasses kind of on the end of his nose and he would do his lecturing. And I remember he, he took his glasses off and he, and he kind of fumbled with an answer for a second, but then he conceded. He said, he said uh, but really, I, 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 I don't know that I can speak to that. I don't know what he would say to this conversation that was being had. Easy enough, and he began to put his glasses on, and he was just about to begin his lecture again, and then he took his glasses off again, and he looked out, he didn't really focus on anybody, he just looked out uh, across the classroom, and he said, I don't suppose I'll ever know the answer to that question. And he put his glasses back on, and, and, and he just, and he carried on. And, and I, funny that that has stuck with me, but there were a couple things that, that really have spoken to me from that memory down through the years, and, and why I'm, I'm going there today. One was just, uh, you know, here, here was this person that I was quite intimidated by and rather in awe of in some respects for his education and learning, um, simply saying the obvious that I probably won't ever have time to go and dig around and read and trying to get into the head of J.I. Packer so that I can respond to that question. That was at the surface level, but there was something else going on at the lower level that was really important for this young student to hear. And that was that uh, he was quite comfortable not knowing. He, he was, he was okay. I mean, this was an eminent biblical scholar that we were being referenced, and he, he doesn't know, wasn't going to have time to know, and that's okay. I don't have to have all the answers. Whatever the rest of the lesson was that day, that one stuck with me, that I don't have to fully understand in order to move forward. And uh, although this may sound incredibly unsatisfying to you at this point in the sermon, um, what we can understand with our minds about the Holy Spirit, it's okay that we will not be able to fully comprehend, that we will not be able to know specifically. In the French language, uh, the verb to know, there's two forms of it. If you, if, if you speak the language, you're already with me here. Savoir and connaître. Um, savoir is uh, the idea of, of facts, of knowing details, of, 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 of comprehension and understanding. Uh, in English, we would say, uh, I, yes, I, I know, I understand, I know those details, I can recite those details for you. Uh, but there's also that verb canetra, which I, I always sort of keep them organized in my brain with the idea of savoir, savvy, or canetra, connect. Uh, I don't know if that's a mnemonic that's going to help you at all, but it works for me. Canetra is relational. It's, it's to, to know someone or, or to know of a place or to know where you are or, 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 or this relational kind of spatial knowledge. Again, in English, we just end up saying, oh, I, I, I know that, I know you. In French, it would be uh, savoir connaître. We 
will never fully understand with our minds this concept of God being one and yet three. There will never be a satisfying answer to that. You can spend a lifetime digging it and trying to articulate it and, 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 and formulating great statements. Of course, the great creeds of the church have attempted to do that. But the bottom line is that here I am, here we are, created finite beings. As I, as I re referenced earlier, I, I live in space and time. I, I cannot move into the future. I cannot return to the past. I cannot conceive of anything outside of the physical realm, which is the universe in which I live. That is an absolute barrier to my thoughts. I, I, can, I can kind of imagine what might be beyond those constraints into the infinite realm of the Almighty God, but it's speculative. I, I, I will never be able to say that savoir, I know and understand the eternal God. There is that an inherent impossibility in that statement. I'm finite, he is infinite, I cannot know the infinite in all of its wholeness. My brain will never be completely satisfied in this journey to try to understand and make sense of it. And so listen, if you're, if you're having this internal struggle right now that says, it just this doesn't kind of make sense to me, that's okay. Because that's not the heart of what we're doing and why Christians have insisted upon this notion of a triune God since the beginning. Because, in fact, while I may not be able to know the triune God completely satisfactorily with my brain, Kenetra, I can know and be in relationship and be utterly and completely and wholly satisfied in my relationship with the eternal singular God who is manifest as three persons and as I move from different expressions and angles of, of my engagement with this eternal God, each of the persons of God become wonderfully and intimately engaged in my life. And uh, where I'm never fully satisfied in the intellectual journey, I can be, you can be, we can be utterly and completely satisfied and wholly engaged with this eternal God, this eternal triune God. So, that's a whole lot of setup for us today, and, and maybe maybe that's almost enough, but, but I do want to dig into the scriptures today. Um, the, the notion of God the Father, let's just do a couple more um, housekeeping things here before we go into John chapter 14. Um, very clear. Uh, many of the Psalms, I, I've written down one of them, Psalm 145, 3. David is writing it. It says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise, his greatness. No one can fathom, right? It's saying what I've been attempting to say as well. We need to start at the beginning that says we, we're, we're in relationship with the eternal God and we are not eternal. <laughs> we, are, we, we are finite. Uh, and so there is this confession that says, I, I can't fully know him. But a couple of key passages that I, I want us to have on the table for us. One of the very, very first verses of the Bible, in the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if there isn't um, a passage that more completely challenges the imagination. I, I don't know which one it is. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Go out tonight, look up into the sky, look at those stars, and try to wrap your brain around the idea that the light that is coming to your eye, the photons that are finally physically arriving to you right now, left the source, that star, millions of years ago in some cases. Uh, the God who can create this <laughs> remarkable universe is, uh, well, his ways, as David says, are beyond our knowing. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, known as the Shema in, uh, in, in Hebrew religious culture. You'll, you've heard it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Those are foundational things for us. Beyond knowing, one God, 
And yet, here in our Christian tradition, we stumble into Jesus. And in Jesus, uh, we, we, we have this conundrum that is, that is remarkable. So again, before we go to chapter 14, can I read just a few verses to you uh, from the Gospel of John specifically? Uh, in John 8, 58, there is an exchange happening with Jesus and some of the teachers of the Jewish law who are challenging him. And um, they, they try to corner him and, and trick him into uh, questions about Moses and Abraham. And uh, Jesus ultimately sort of rears up and, and stops them in their tracks. And he says these words, this is John 8, 58. He says, before Abraham was born, I am. Now, it sounds like an almost curious grammatical construct. Before Abraham was born, I am. But there's a whole lot to it. Uh, the expression I am, ego, a me in Greek is um, almost a redundant phrase. The verb ego, the form in and of itself says I am, or uh, says I am, uh, a me says I am, ego is the, is the pronoun I. And, and so the literal translation would be I, I am. Before Abraham was born, I, I am. Um, the significance of that is that uh, when those early um, Jewish uh, leaders were trying to navigate their faith into a world which was dominated then by the Greek language along all the trade routes and into the various surrounding countries, they did in fact translate the Old Testament into Greek. We call it the uh, Septuagint. And uh, when they got to that passage of scripture, when God is confronting Moses and Moses is saying, listen, I, I get it, you want me to go to these people, but they're not going to want to follow me. Who, who should I tell them has sent me? And he, God says to, to Moses, tell them that I am has sent you. And, and in order to sort of distinguish the force of that expression, uh, the Jewish translators who were translating the Old Testament into Greek um, used this curious formation of saying, ego, emi, I, I am. Uh, just to make sure that it had a force to it. So when Jesus then quotes that, his hearers hear him saying, exactly as God said to Moses, before Abraham was, I am. It, it, was, a, it was a literal claim to being divine, the God. And if there's any question about that interpretation or translation, the very next verse in chapter 8 says, And they picked up stones, and they were about to throw and kill him. Why? For blasphemy. There's no question that they understood what he was saying. And so here we have this expression of this eternal, unknowable God, uh, one God. And along comes Jesus, who says without any ambiguity in that passage, that... Uh, I am, I am the God of our ancestors. In the first verses, chapter of uh, John chapter 1, it begins much like the Genesis passage, which said, in the beginning God created. John chapter 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. And so John is harking us back to that Genesis passage of creation. And he's, and, and, and he's beginning to talk about this, this character that he refers to as the word of the logos or the logic of God, if you would. And then a little later in chapter one, he says this, the word, the word of creation, the word became flesh and dwells among us, Jesus. And so we, we, we do run headlong into the unambiguous expression that this one eternal God is known in the man Jesus. And so we've got to wrestle with these things and try to make some sense of them. And so with that sort of uh, as a uh, long, complicated foundation uh, for our reading today, let's go to John chapter 14. I'm looking at my clock, it says I'm almost 20 minutes in and I'm just starting to preach, so to speak, but we won't take a long time in this specific passage because I think it just speaks for itself without me having to do a whole lot of exegesis. And so I, I'm going to just pause as I read along and just sort of flesh out some details as we go. So John chapter 14, 
And uh, I'm going to begin reading at verse 5. Um, the setup is this. They've just had a last supper together. Judas has left to go and betray Jesus and tell the authorities where they'll be able to find him, arrest him, and then ultimately crucify him. So he's talking to the ten who have remained, or to the eleven that have remained. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now listen to these words. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You see Jesus aligning himself with, with the God that these Jewish men had always identified as, as the one God. Another disciple jumps in, Philip, Lord, show us the Father, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Is there any ambiguity there? I don't think so. I don't think so. Jesus says to them, point blank, you want to know the eternal God? If you've seen me, you've seen the eternal God. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't, uh, don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least, or at least, he says, believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. What's a miracle? A miracle is when something happens that is impossible to uh, be completed or exercised within all of the limitations of the created realm. There are the laws of physics that govern us within this realm. There is the law of time and atrophy and death that is a part of our existence. And so when something comes into our realm and does something that shouldn't be able to be happened, we call it a miracle. And Jesus is saying to him, listen, I, I, I am... <laughs> Believe my words, but if you can't, just don't you recall that I have done things amongst you that only the eternal God from outside of the realm of creation could have accomplished? I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He'll do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. A couple weeks ago, the Ascension. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. And I'd love to go digging around in that for a, a long time, but, but he's underscoring for his disciples not only this unity, this union that he has with the Father, but now he's beginning to tease them about an opportunity to enter into a relationship with this united God by telling them that, listen, what you've seen me do, you can have this privilege too. You can have the privilege of not being bound within the rules and laws and physics of this created order. Some of your, like, your minds are being blown right now. Where's Pastor Gordon going with this? In fact, the caveat, of course, is that this is an invitation into the work of God, the heart of God, the plan of God. And inasmuch as I align myself with the plans of God, I will be, apparently, according to Jesus' words, enabled to do exactly what he was doing in ways that were not constricted by the created order's rules. Well, how's that happen? Well, now he, he begins to introduce to them to the person that we call the third person of the Trinity, or the Holy Spirit. Verse um, 15, we're at. If you love me, you'll obey what I command. Right? 
Are you with me or not? Are you going to let me be your Lord or not? That's an expression of love. We, we can say that we love the Lord all we want, but, but, but it comes down to, uh, will we do what he commands us? If you love me, you obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, right, the eternal, unknowable God of creation, I'll ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. Another counselor to be with you forever. This is a man who is literally standing in front of his disciples, physically in their presence, who we know, because we know the storyline, we know he's going to be crucified, that there will be this extraordinary event of his resurrection to life, proving his authority over the rules of the created realm. And then he ascends back into the presence of God. Uh, I, I, on Ascension Sunday, I, I did preach specifically on the Ascension, and, and I was, I hope that others were impressed. I was, I was blown away in, in, in my study of that, of recognizing that in that Genesis account, the beginning of the Bible, that talks about how God created the heavens and the earth, and then describes this picture of God walking with his creatures, Adam and Eve. This idea that the eternal fully engages with the finite, the created order, and then of course it goes messy as Adam and Eve you know, to summarize, say, listen, we don't need you to be the Lord of our lives. We can do this on our own. And, and, and the whole of creation then unfolds year after year after thousands of years to us today with this pattern where we are struggling again to re-engage with the Eternal One who would be Lord of our lives. And now Jesus, who has lived his life in our flesh, ascends to the Father, still in our flesh, so that once again now in the realm of the Eternal the created body of Jesus, the, 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 the finiteness of, of who we are, is once again enjoined in this perfect fellowship in with the eternal Father. And from that union, hope I'm not losing you here, I geek out on this stuff all the time. From that union comes the Holy Spirit, who Jesus says would be with us forever the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him this isn't savoir this is connectro this is connection this is relationship you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. We're very careful in our doctrinal um, articulation to not speak of the Holy Spirit merely as the force of God or the influence of God or the power of God. Although truthfully sometimes we're a little bit reckless in our language and in our prayers and even in our preaching. No, no, the eternal unknowable God who took our flesh so that we might know him and who has enjoined our created order with his infinite order again through Christ at the re through the re after the resurrection and through the ascension now that God comes to us again in his Holy Spirit I may not be able to fully comprehend the infinite God, but I know Jesus. I can comprehend Jesus. I can see and understand in Jesus who is one with the Father. I, 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 I see the character of God, the character of his love. I hear Jesus tell us emphatically, emphatically, that he is not about his rights or his privileges. He's going to lay it down so that he may love and serve others. That's the character of God that I see in Jesus and that I know in Jesus. I, I, I watch as Jesus expresses compassion to others. I see his heart to want to heal and see people restored. I understand and I know this. I, I don't miss anything about the character of God because it is fully seen for us in Jesus. 
God in the flesh. I, I, I can know God in these relational notions because I can then enter into and emulate Jesus in my own life, and not only as a poor imitation, but because when I allow him to be the Lord, and when I say, okay, listen, I'm going to take on the very character of Jesus. I want the character of God to be dominant in who I am and the way that I interact with others and express myself in this life. That opens the opportunity then for the Lord to say, great, because now then I'm going to be actually present with you. I'm going to be present with you. My Holy Spirit is going to come and He is going to fill you. And as you live in obedience to me and trying to put on the character of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will be at work within you. And He is going to show you things in your life that you need to deal with. And He's going to show you opportunities in your life that you would never have dared believe it because, of course, within your own capacity you can't do it. But because God is with you, there is now no limits on what you can do if you are being obedient to Jesus. None of the, none of the emphasis upon self, but the very character of God who lays down his life for others. Is that where you're at? But boy, I want to be able to say that that's where I'm at. It's a journey for me. It's, it's a journey that many times it's been really hard. But this idea of the eternal, unknowable God who, who reveals his character perfectly to us in Jesus, who then comes to us by his Spirit so that there can be transformation in my life, it describes and it paints this picture of this extraordinary relationship that I get to experience with the eternal God. And I try to put it in words, and, and it comes out in a long 30-minute sermon like this, and... Is my brain satisfied with the contradiction of one God yet three? I mean, I, I love the journey. I, I, I love the process. I, I think year by year by year, I, I have a better understanding of the Trinity. I think. But what I know, what I know, is that as I live in fellowship with God, serving Jesus and His mandate, learning to know Him, that I more and more know the character of God, and allowing then for God to come to me and into me and to work through me through the Holy Spirit. Whether I know it better. I, I know God more and more and more. And the sense of fulfillment of being in right relationship with the eternal God, the sense of wholeness that I feel knowing that I have been returned to this place of relational dependence upon the eternal God, I, 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 I am where I'm supposed to be. I know who I am as a creature of the Creator. And that gives to me such a profound sense of peace and fulfillment and wholeness. I, I, I know God in my heart. Even as this cerebral geeky guy is never going to be satisfied. Because I simply don't have the capacity. I'm okay not knowing all the answers in my brain because I know that God has come to his creatures in Christ and I know that God wants to now fulfill, to fill within the hearts, uh, the imaginations, the life of those who are prepared to let Jesus be the Lord, to, to be obedient to him. And um, that makes it okay that I don't have the complete answer to articulate the triune God who first loved me and now I can say I love him. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, eternal God, You are beyond knowing, and yet you come to us in Christ. 
through whom we recognize your heart and through whom we can understand your character. in our determination to now let you be Lord again. You graciously pour into us your Holy Spirit, the very presence of the Almighty God. You want to work in me. You want to shape me. You want to direct me. You want to lead me. Oh Lord, help me. Help me in my feeble efforts to try to understand your infinite being with my finite mind. But even as that will always come up short, fill me more and more. Help me to know you in my being. Help me, Lord God, to revel in the relationship that you want for your creatures to know. of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bless you, my Penticton friends. I'll see you again next week.